Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I'm going to be discussing power earnings gaps and how to detect them using Python code and the Quant Connect platform. So what is a power earnings gap? First of all, well, this is a trading setup I first heard about from this trader named Trader Stewie. He's been very active on financial Twitter since 2009. He has over 370,000 followers and you'll often see him post different chart setups like this for, uh, for instance, today he posted ARRY, Array Technologies, and highlighted this bar right here as a power earnings gap. So today I wanna to discuss what this is and how to detect that using Python code. And you may be saying, I'm very skeptical, right? Why should I just believe what some random person on Twitter said? Why should I believe these people on YouTube that are talking about this strategy? And you'd be correct. There's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of uh, strategies that are promoted out there that are completely inaccurate and don't hold up when you actually look at the data. And that's the benefit of this channel. I'm gonna show you uh, what that is, like talk about what the setup is. And then I've taken some time to write out the Python code for this using the Quant Connect platform. That way you can plug it in and detect every single occurrence of this uh, trading setup over the past 25 years. You can enter in different entries and exits and test this out and see what are the actual results. And so what I've done here is set a breakpoint here, and I'm gonna show you how to use the debugger to step through this code and figure out how to code this step by step. You see, I've set a breakpoint here and run this, and you can see where it stopped here, and the symbol it stopped on was ENPH in phase. A lot of people are looking at this chart right now, so this is another example of a power earnings gap. As you can see, uh, I actually wrote this at the end of last week. So there's a power earnings gap right here. You can see there's this consolidation and you can see just the last couple of days after Labor Day, uh, after I uh, wrote this article, you can see it just popped out. So does that mean all of them are gonna do that? Well, let's find out, right? You don't have to take my word for it. You can follow the Python code. You can enter and exit however you please, trade it however you want, or you can say, this is garbage. I don't wanna trade this at all and discard it altogether. Either way, you learn a bit about Python. You learn a little bit about how to trade these earnings gaps or any kind of gaps, and you learn the Quant Connect platform, which will let you uh, test any trading strategy you can think of using a whole universe of data for 25 years, and you can automatically trade whatever strategy you can come up with. As always, before we get started with the tutorial, if you could please like and subscribe and check out Interactive Brokers using the link below. It takes a long time to write all this content out and record videos, come up with project ideas, code them and do all this myself. So if you could do those three things, really helps support the channel. So let's go ahead and get started with the tutorial. So let's start at the beginning. What is a power earnings gap? Well, a power earnings gap is a large gap up in price that occurs after a company reports earnings. So here's an example right here. So AMD, this is from, I think it's 2015 or 2016 right here. Uh, there is a earnings report. So uh, trading view shows this E here when there's an earnings date. And you can see right after earnings, there was a large gap in price. But this gap is not enough to be a power earnings gap as described in this article uh, by Trader Stewie on his blog right here. Uh, the power earnings gap only occurs if there's follow through the next day. So you see there's the gap, but then there's this daily bar that occurs afterwards. And you can see this large green bar. So this means that there was a strong close the day after the gap occurred. So if it gaps up after earnings and then it sells off or fades, then it's not considered a power earnings gap. It needs to be a very strong close and close near the highs of the day after earnings. So the hypothesis here is that there's a strong unexpected earnings reaction and that this will trigger a multi-month move. So there should be a lot of volume here. So this is unexpected earnings report and then everybody and their brother is trying to get into the stock and sometimes you'll see them pile in over the next uh, several days, right? And so let's go over a few more examples of this that people have discussed that occurred in 2021. One example here that I've seen discussed is DocuSign. You see the earnings here, the gap up, you can see the strong follow through, and then it went up like another 50% or so. Same with a MongoDB here. You can see it closed near the lows of the day before earnings were reported, gapped up, closed strong, and it ran another, looks like 25, 30% right there. And then upstart is another example. You see uh, earnings right here, and then you see a huge amount of volume, gap up, strong follow through, and then the stock, I think, at least doubled or even almost tripled uh, from there. And you might be saying to yourself, those things all occurred in 2021, and all of these stocks have uh, since collapsed, right? And you'd be correct. These are all these growth stocks that everyone was piling into, but this is a 
strategy that is used by swing traders. And these types of traders try to capitalize on short-term momentum, and then they just exit when this momentum wanes. So uh, they don't care about the long-term uh, growth of these stocks necessarily. They're interested in holding a position for a few weeks to a few months, making some money, and then getting out. So this all sounds great. Who doesn't want to double their money in a few months, right? What's the problem? Upstart, DocuSign, enter, exit, boom. Good. Well, it could be too good to be true, right? So let's talk about some examples where this failed. Usually when you see these uh, setups presented, this they will be presented with a few a very specific uh, cherry-picked examples, right? And, and they show when it worked, and that's very viable. That's a very good selling point. But they don't really show you all the times it failed. They might show one or two saying, this is a failed breakout to give the appearance of neutrality. Um, but if you scan for these and let your code find all of these setups, you'll see tens of thousands of these that failed often, right? And so what I wanted to do is write the code and see how many of these succeeded and how many of them failed. And so I listed a few examples from the past few weeks alone. So you can see Cloudflare, a huge gap up right there. If you would have entered any time after that, you're not gonna enter it before, you would have entered here, you'd already be down probably 15 or 20% right there. Or let's look at Etsy here. You, there's a power earnings gap, there's earnings, there's the gap. Looks like a strong close, looks like some good volume and hasn't really gone anywhere. Maybe you could argue you could peel a little bit of profits out of that. Uh, the trade desk, you can see gigantic gap right there, gigantic volume there. And you can see you could have entered after at, at 70 something and you probably down another 15 or 20% right there. So there's a few examples where, you know, it doesn't seem to be working very well for you at all. but. You'll see when Trader Stewie posts about this, he usually posts some type of complex price pattern afterwards. So for instance, in phase was an example that was posted. So there's a power earnings gap. And he likes to use these multi-week and multi-month like falling wedges and flags and triangles uh, and things like that as well. And so I think the argument he would make is that you're supposed to wait for it to digest or rest for a while and consolidate and digest uh, that gap up afterwards, and then you maybe enter after it breaks out. So um, that's another approach you can take. So the examples recently are in phase, which seems to be doing pretty well right now. Uh, Array Technologies is one to watch, and this Catalyst Pharmaceuticals is another example here. So you can see a power earnings gap, and then he likes to use these falling wedge setups. Uh, my opinion on these patterns is they're a little bit difficult to uh, quantify, right? So my eye is saying, oh yeah, I guess that's a falling wedge, but it's hard, you know, when you try to program that, it's hard to say exactly what qualifies as a, a falling wedge. Maybe that's um, an area I will tackle in the future. Um, but one thing you can do, there's this a functionality called consolidators in Quant Connect, so you could determine if a stock has rested for a certain period and then enter after it breaks out. And so one example we discussed in the past was the uh, opening range breakout. And there's examples of this discussed on the Quant Connect platform here where they consolidate by, uh, so they'll get like 15 minutes of data at the opening range and then determine when it breaks out of that range and you can trade it. Turns out that's not that great of a strategy, but there's a good example of how to use it if you look at the opening range breakout uh, example. So if you want to trade it this way, you can. So those are a few examples of the setup, both when it's been successful and times it has failed. But the only way to know for sure how many times it's been successful and how many times it's failed is to actually run some code that can scan through 20 years of data. You're not gonna do that by hand, right? There's thousands of different stocks, they've changed symbols, et cetera, et cetera. So if we code it with Quant Connect, uh, we can determine whether this is a good strategy. We can try different entries and exits and it will spit out a back test and tell us black and white, was this good or did you lose all of your money? And there's no, you know, waving your hands, you know, I can sound good and persuasive and cherry pick and show you what I wanna show you, but the data doesn't lie to you. So I'm going to be coding this using Python and Quant Connect. Some people might ask, why are you using Quant Connect? They want me to code everything from scratch using Python and don't wanna use a platform. So there's a few reasons I've been using Quant Connect uh, lately. Number one, I'm doing uh, this season of the channel is dedicated to frameworks for algo trading. So I post that in July and I was following through on Jesse Trade, uh, Freck Trade, and Quant Connect. So this is kind of the last one I'm covering for Quant Connect. 
Um, secondly, um, it has all this historical data for both fundamental and uh, split adjusted price data across many different timeframes. And so if I want to look at earnings for AMD in, in 2007, I can look at that on Quant Connect. And then also it has brokerage modeling for interactive brokers, and I'm going to be using that for live trading. So I want something that accurately reflects fees. A lot of people show back tests without any fees. I've done that before myself, and we want to be as accurate as possible and stop doing that uh, going forward. And note, even though I'm talking about Quant Connect a lot, I wanted to say I have no affiliation with Quant Connect, but also just today I noticed on their page, they launched a crowdfunding campaign to raise some investments. And I did just throw, throw a little bit of money in here. So they're raising a round. Um, and if you look here on what people say, you see that I'll get old part-time Larry threw in an investment just to participate in this, just a little bit of money. Occasionally I do a little mini investment in a startup or something that I believe in. And so I've given a little bit of money to Gumroad, Quant Connect, and Replit, because I think they're pretty cool. I want to see these things grow and succeed. And also this raises my confidence that this platform is going to be around for a while. So yeah, in case you want to invest in Quant Connect, you actually can do that right now. All right, let's go ahead and get started with coding our power earnings gap scanner. So in order to do this, the first concept we need to understand is the concept of static and dynamic universes. So let's talk about this. So on any given day, Quant Connect provides this huge universe of tradable assets. I think there's like 8,000 of these uh, assets, at least for equities, right? And you don't want to trade 8,000 equities on any given day. You only want to trade uh, certain assets on any given day. So you have some different criteria for selecting what you want to trade. And these could be uh, technical attributes or fundamental attributes. You might want to filter for stocks above a certain moving average. Stocks have certain market cap. Maybe you just want to trade small cap or large cap stocks and so forth, right? And so there's this concept of static and dynamic universes. So a static universe means that you know all the symbols you want to trade in advance. So for instance, in the last Quant Connect tutorial I did, we knew we wanted to trade the S&P 500 ETF. And so we just called Add Equity Spy and we gave it a resolution. We wanted spy data on the minute time frame, right? And so this is static and fixed and we just call it Add Equity. Now with dynamic universes, we this universe of stocks changes every single day. We don't know exactly what symbols we want to uh, select. We just have some rules for selecting them. So maybe we want to trade stocks above the 50 day moving average. We only want stocks that overbought or oversold. Uh, we want stocks that recently reported earnings and so forth. And so for this case, we need a dynamic universe. And so instead of add equity, we call a function called add universe. And we need to define different filters. So we need to take all these thousands of assets and filter them down just to the ones that match our criteria. And so I use an analogy here. Uh, I have a little diagram I included of a makeshift water filter. And so this uh, in, at the top here, consider this contaminated water. So this is just the whole universe of assets and you need to filter this down by passing it through multiple filters, right? And so uh, this came from, I think, Walking Dead. And so there's some episode where they create a makeshift water filter. And so they filter some river down to get drinkable water at the bottom. And so you can actually make a water filter and pass it through layers of sands and rocks and stuff like this. And the reason I use this example is this filter here, there's a level called coarse sand and fine sand. And this is actually what they call them in Quant Connect. So you need to define what's called a coarse filter and a fine filter. And so after the entire universe of stocks pass through your filters, you'll get only this select few stocks at the bottom. And so when we're coding the power earnings gap, which filters do we need? We want to find highly liquid stocks and we don't want to trade penny stocks. Secondly, we need stocks that have recently reported earnings. Third, we want stocks that gapped up strongly after earnings. And four, we want a bullish follow through the next day. So we want stocks that close near the high the following day after the initial earnings gap. So we need to figure out how to use coarse and fine filters and various functions in Quant Connect to find candidates that meet these criteria. So let's go ahead and get started with Quant Connect. I already have an account. I'm going to be using the platform itself, not the command line to do this because it's nicely uh, integrated and easier to use this way. I think the uh, command line will evolve over time to let you do everything on the website, let you do it locally. But for now, I think it's a little bit easier to use it on the website. 
So I'm signed in right now and I'm gonna click create new algorithm. So when you create a new Quant Connect algorithm, it'll load a coding environment. This has like a Visual Studio code editor actually embedded into the web browser, which is pretty cool. So it actually doesn't feel like you're coding in a web browser. It feels pretty, pretty native here. So it just feels just like VS Code, which we already use. You can see it puts a default algorithm here and I'm gonna change the name of this up here and I'm gonna call it uh, Power Earnings Gap Scanner. And then I'll even change the name of this class. So it gives you like some random words here. And I like to just name it so I, I can see it in my listing and I know which one's which. You can see the default class here extends a class called QC algorithm. So that's just the default Quant Connect algorithm class. It has an initialized function. So it initializes all the equities we wanna trade, gives a start date for the back test. It sets an initial cash amount, and then there's an on data function. And what this does is since we requested all this data on the minute time frame, it'll run this function every minute. And so we can check on the first bar if we're not invested in SPY, the bond ETF, and Apple stock, then it allocates one third of our holdings to each one of these symbols. And the default strategy is very simple. However, this probably outperformed 99.9% .9 of traders over the last uh, 20 years. So if I go back in time 10 years, let's say from 2012, so I can go September 7th or September 2nd of 2012, through today, I hit play and look at that. Made tons of money, great performance, didn't put any thought into it whatsoever. Now, while we're on the sample algorithm, I wanna quickly show you how to use the Quant Connect debugger. I know it's not an exciting topic, but it's gonna save you tons and tons of time. Because what I see out there is a lot of people are sending me stack traces and bug reports and things like that, and I can't debug everyone's code. It takes long enough to just write these tutorials and whatnot, right? But if you learn how to use the debugger, you can actually pause the execution of your code and step through it line by line and see the entire state of your program. And so a lot of people just know how to do print debugging and you can just print what's going on at any given time. But when you're running something across the course of 20 years and get earnings gaps are happening, different uh, symbols are changing over time. If you just print everything that's going on, it's just gonna flood the logs with thousands of lines and you're not gonna be able to figure out what's going on. And so the benefit of knowing how to use the debugger is that you can just pause the execution of your program. So this on data here, I can just, all I need to do, click to the left here, set a breakpoint, right? And then instead of hitting the play, I'm gonna hit the one with the bug on it. And what this will do is pause execution at that line and I can inspect in the debugger on the side here what's going on. So you see right here, this shows all my files and that's the state of my program. And so on data here, it paused there and then I can look at self and I can look at data. So data in on data here, I can see every minute of my program and step through it and make sure it's functioning like I want it to. So you can see right here, self.time is a September 4, so month nine and day four, and then it's hour nine and minute 31. So the stock market opens at 931 in New York. And so that's the first minute of the first trading day. So this is probably a weekend day, right? And so if I wanna skip over to the next minute, I can hit continue. And you notice I can see what it looked like at 932. I can continue. So 933, 934, 935. And so you're gonna need to walk through this to make sure all your entry and exit signals are executing properly and they can see what's going on in your portfolio. And so if I wanna drill down to a specific value, right? If I wanna see self.portfolio, I can do that. I can add a watch and just watch this one variable, right? And so this helps you see the structure. There's so many different objects on Quant Connect that you won't know them all unless you dig through the documentation or you can browse what's available by adding a watch here. So if I wanna see what portfolio looks like, I can see all the functions I can call and I can see this invested attribute. And so you can see I'm invested now. So after the first bar, this invests. So what I'm gonna do is stop this real quick. So I'm gonna disconnect the debugger. And here you can see my machine. So I have a back test node here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the debugger again and let's observe how this works, right? And so let me, Make sure my node is stopped. Okay, so if you look in your resources here, sometimes if you stop it too early, you can click stop and that'll stop your back testing node just like that, right? And so if it says, if you get that message that it's in use, make sure your back test node is stopped, right? And so now I'm gonna hit the debug again. I'm gonna let this run and it's gonna stop at my breakpoint. And what we're gonna do is see how this switches over from self.portfolio invested is false to self.portfolio invested is true. Right, And so if I look at self.portfolio, or I can even add a more specific watch here. So I'm gonna do self.portfolio.invested on the side here. You see it's false. 
So this is the first minute of the day. If it's not invested, then it's gonna invest it by setting the holdings. So if I do this step over, this will just go to the next line and you can see how it's setting my holdings, right? And now if I do continue, you'll see all of a sudden self.portfolio invested is true. And if I do step over, you'll see it won't hit that line again because self.portfolio.invested is true. And so what you should do is make sure you're very familiar with how this debugger works, like stepping, like continuing and stepping over, and that'll help you debug your code and see what's going on. And if you want more detailed instructions on the debugger, I've written it up on the website, hackingthemarkets.com, and circled the most important parts of this right here if you wanna make sure you understand this really well. All right, so back to our coarse filters and fine filters. So we wanna pass the entire universe of equities through a couple different filtering functions, the coarse filter and fine filter, and then also filter a little bit at market open. And at the end, we just want to have this beautiful, delicious a stream of data that we can consume in our algorithm. So this represents just the equities and data that we want to actually subscribe to. So to use this, we need to do self.add universe instead of self.add equity. So I'm to take this line and I'm gonna put this in my algorithm. So we can get rid of the add equities here and do add universe. And these are the names of two functions we need. So we need a coarse filter and a fine filter function. And so I'm gonna define these functions right here. So I'm gonna define a function called coarse filter and I'm gonna define a function called a fine filter, just like that. And I'm gonna do a, just a pass here for now. So I'm not gonna have it do anything and a pass there for now. So what you do here with add universe is you need to pass it these two function names. So I'm giving it the function name course filter. I'm defining that function. I'm giving it the name find filter, defining that function. Now, what are the inputs to the course filter function? So if you look at my document here, you see how we have the entire universe. This is the input to the course filter. So the whole universe will come into the course filter and then we need to only let a certain amount of them pass through and continue down. So we need to return only the symbols from this big list uh, that match whatever criteria we need, right? So this function here has an input called universe that Quant Connect passes to it. So just like any other Python function that's part of a class, there's a reference to self, which is just a reference to this QC algorithm object. And then there's an input that we can call universe. Sometimes you'll see people call it just coarse or fine. I'm gonna call it universe. So I'll call it universe right there. And then let's see what that universe looks like. So this universe is just a list of stock symbols. And so what I'll do is since that's a list, I'll just do for asset in universe. And I'm just gonna do a pass here. I'm gonna use my debugger just so you can see what these stock symbols look like. So I'm gonna go ahead and click debug here. And so I'm gonna let this pause on each asset in the universe. And let's just quickly inspect them so we can see what we're dealing with. So you can see my execution is paused. I'll get rid of this one since I don't need it anymore. And let's look at asset right here. So you can see each time if I hit continue, this is just gonna loop over this entire universe. So there's universe, I'm looping over, so this is an iterator, I'm iterating over, and then each of these assets are different. And so if I look at this, I have an adjusted price for whatever that asset is, and then I have a dollar volume, I have a market, so this is a USA market. Uh, you see a price there, split factor, and then look at that, there's a symbol right here. So that symbol is a symbol object, and then that symbol has a value. So there's a value called uh, AACC. So what I'll do is create a watch here, and I'm gonna say asset dot uh, symbol dot value, just like that, you see that? And then if I continue, and so you can see all I'm really doing is looping through all the symbols in this universe. And what I need to do is filter down this list and only return the ones I want. And we know how to filter down a list in Python. So we can just use a list comprehension to do that. And this is the common uh, idiom you'll see here. You'll see uh, you just return a list of only the assets you want. And so I'm doing asset for asset in universe. If the dollar volume is greater than a certain amount, the price is greater than a certain amount, and the asset has fundamental data. So I'm gonna take this line and put it here. And so instead of just looping through them like that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this real quick, make sure it's stopped. And also let me uh, zoom in a little bit. Sorry about that. I realize that sometimes uh, that text is quite small on the screen. So let me see if I can zoom in for you. All right, and then I'm gonna collapse that down a bit, okay? And so what I do now is the universe here I'm going to filter it down and return a new universe. And so asset for asset in universe, I'm looping through an inline. I'm saying if the asset's dollar volume is greater than a million, 
and then the price is greater than 10. Remember, we don't want to trade any penny stocks. And then we're also checking that the asset has fundamental data. So that's another attribute if you inspect uh, asset here. And what that does is allow you to filter out ETFs because they don't have fundamental data. There's some strategies where you might want to trade ETFs, but in this case, we just want stocks that gapped up on earnings, right? And so we don't want to trade like SPY or IWM in that case because they don't have this fundamental data and there's no real earnings report to look at. And so this will filter this universe down to just ones that have these attributes. And so this will knock out a couple thousand stocks probably. And then I'll zoom in on the website here and let's look at these line by line. I could type these out in order, but uh, this video is probably gonna be over an hour long. So I'm gonna save a little bit of time by doing a little bit of pasting since I've already written this out before and I'll make sure I explain all of it instead of just copy pasting and not saying anything, okay? So I have this universe defined now. The other thing I wanna do is sort this universe. And so there's a Python built-in sorted function. You can pass it a list. So the list is called universe. So this is this universe is filtered down some. I'm gonna sort this list by dollar volume. And so what this does is use this a Lambda function. So a function that doesn't have a name. And I say, filter it on the attribute of dollar volume. And the reverse is true, reverse equals true parameter specifies that I wanna sort, sort it from uh, highest to smallest. So we want the most liquid assets. So we're sorting by dollar volume. And so this might return still be a few thousand. Now we still don't wanna trade a few thousand. We only want the most liquid assets. And so we can get the top sorted by dollar volume. So we can sort by dollar volume. And since it's a list in Python, if we want the first 500 elements of the list, we can do uh, nothing here than colon 500. If I wanted the top 100, I could do like that, right? Right, so this will return us the top 500 sorted by volume. And then all we need to do is return a list of symbol objects. Remember each of these assets has a symbol and in a fine filter or coarse filter, you wanna return a list of symbol objects. So you need to do this dot symbol here. So we're looping through top by sorted by volume and then we're returning the actual symbol attribute and see how I returned symbol objects at the end here. So that's that. Now I've also put another line here uh, saying ticker symbol values only. So each of these symbols is an object. And so for debugging purposes, I want the symbol's value to see the actual letters like AAPL for Apple, but the symbol object actually has a lot more attributes to it. And that's what you return from a filter. But just to show you the ticker symbol values only so that we see the top, five, top 500 most liquid stocks. And I show you that, I'm gonna click the debugger again and let's look at what ticker symbol values only has inside of it. I'm gonna get rid of that breakpoint by clicking again. I'm gonna click continue now. And now let's look at it paused at symbol objects. So you can see my list of all these different symbol objects. So zero, zero. And so there, there should be 500 of these. So you see the type is quant connect symbol. So if I look at this, th this is actually a, a whole object here. So it has a lot of other stuff like a security type. So I'm sure, assuming that's security type equity, but there's security types for options uh, as well. But you see it has a value as well. And then you can also see my uh, symbol values only or my ticker symbol values only. And so if I look at the 500 most liquid tickers, you'll see Apple, Google, Microsoft, Intel, the types of stocks you would expect. So those are the most traded stocks and so forth, right? So looking pretty good. We're able to return a list of objects from the course filter. So we've made it through the first level. Now let's move on to the fine filter and filter down to stocks that actually reported earnings. So now what I'm gonna do is switch over to this fine filter function. And just like uh, the course filter, it accepts an input. So uh, a universe comes in here, I pass a, I return a list of symbols, and then that list of symbols comes in here to the fine filter. And so let's loop through uh, this universe. So I'm gonna do for, for asset and universe again, and I am going to set my break point down here in the fine filter, oops. And then I'm gonna run this and let's see what it looks like inside of the fine filter function. So now you can see we've stopped at my breakpoint in the fine filter function. So it paused here and you'll notice if you expand out the assets here, so it stopped on Google as the first symbol in this universe. And when I expand out here, you see we have a bunch of different attributes here. So the difference between the coarse filter and the fine filter here is when I'm looping through the assets in the coarse filter, I'm filtering by these very coarse or general um, attributes like dollar volume, just a general price and whether it has fundamental data. But if you drill down into the fine filter, this is more and more specific. And so you'll see there's lots of attributes attributes here like the uh, company profile. So it shows like 
uh, enterprise value here. And if, and if I scroll down here, you see there's an attribute for the different earnings ratios. So maybe I want to filter by uh, the profit to earnings ratio or profit to sales. You can see I can look through uh, financial statements here. And you can also see this one called earnings reports. And so since I want to filter based on earnings reports, if I uh, expand earning reports here, you'll see a file date. So if you scroll down here past EPS and dividend per share, you can see the file date right here. And so this is 2012. And so at the very beginning of this, I'm running it from September 2012 uh, to the current date. And so you can see the first time it stops, the last file date we have is July 24th of 2012. So one nice thing about Quant Connect is we have a record of all these earnings reports going back decades, right? And so what I'm gonna do is use this file date to determine uh, when this company reported earnings. And so if I jump back to the website here, you can see how I've defined the fine filter here. And so I'm going to take this and put this inside of my fine filter function in place of here. I'm gonna get rid of this breakpoint and I have an input of course universe or I can just call this a universe. And so I'm going to go ahead and stop this. Okay, so I'll stop this and I'm gonna loop through this course universe that comes in. And so uh, I called it just course universe here. So I'll go ahead and leave it like this so I don't uh, deviate from the website in case you do any copy paste yourself. So I'm looping through the course universe symbols and I'm checking the earnings reports and the file date. And I'm gonna check if that file date is yesterday. And I'm also gonna do a filter on market cap. So I'm gonna say, I want a stocks with a market cap greater than 1 billion. So this one times 10 to the ninth here. But if you wanted to trade only small caps, for instance, someone wanted to trade small caps in the comments, so you could filter down to stocks that have market cap less than two or three billion. I forget what amount is defined as a small cap stock these days. And so for earnings date yesterday, so this file date is a date object. So all I'm doing is getting my self.time, which is a, a date object, and I'm subtracting a time delta of one day, and that would be equal to yesterday. So what I'll do here now, just to see how this is operating, I'm gonna set a breakpoint there. And so instead of starting at September 2nd of 2012, I want something more recent so that I can look it up real quick and, and point to some examples from the recent uh, past. So I'm gonna go to 2022, and I'm gonna go to uh, July uh, 20th right here. So I'm gonna go back just a couple months, about a month and a half, and I'm going to run my debugger again. So let's look at some stocks that reported earnings in July. So I'm pausing this here, and you can see my ticker simple values only stops on LMT and NVS. And so whenever I create this dynamic universe, this is running every single day. So since I started this at uh, July 20th here, then yesterday is July 19th. And so if I log a self.time here, right, I can see the stocks where the uh, file date is equal to yesterday. So the file date for LMT and NVS is July 19th. And so if I go to a trading view here and just to verify, so this is Lockheed Martin, you can see July 19th is the earnings date right here and you can see the earnings reaction. I can also look at this other symbol, NVS, right? And so if I type NVS, I forget what symbol that is, uh, Novartis here. You can also see an earnings date here and this is also for uh, July 19th. So you can see I found stocks where the uh, earnings date, uh, the file date was yesterday. So I can click continue here and once we get to the next day, you'll see a new set of symbols. So those are three symbols right there. Next set of symbols for a different day. You can see the Netflix earnings right there and so forth, intuitive surgical and so forth. So we have some different ticker symbol values for each day. And so now hopefully you see how dynamic universe selection works. This algorithm runs every single day for the period of time we've defined. And this universe selection is happening uh, when the market is closed. And so you can see uh, each day, the entire universe comes in, goes through, the, through a course filter. So it goes down from like 8,000 or whatever down to maybe a few thousand. Then it passes through a fine filter and we filter down by market cap, maybe we get down to a few hundred, and then we eventually get it down to this fine universe. And so since I'm filtering this down to just symbols that reported earnings, you can see we get this down to just a small handful of symbols. So there's like 10 or 15 stocks we might be trading any given day since we started with the 500 most liquid and then filtered it down even further. So you see Tesla earnings and Newmont mining, IBM and so forth, right? 
And so now that we have our universe narrowed down to a very specific uh, set of stocks, uh, after the market opens, we can check the history, the price history of some of these and see uh, what does the price action look like before earnings and what does the price action look like after earnings. And then from there, we can see if there was a gap up and we can see if there was strong follow through after that gap up and then maybe make a trade based on that. So let's move on to filtering this down even further to only the stocks that gapped up after earnings were reported. So how are we going to go about detecting these gaps after the market opens? Well, if you watched my first tutorial on the Quant Connect Lean algorithmic trading engine, we traded the open and the close. And so if you look at my after market open function right here, we ran a scheduled event every single day after the market opens and we ran it for a certain symbol. So we ran it on SPY. And so I'm just gonna do that right here. So since these scheduled events require a symbol and we don't know what symbols we're going to be trading every single day, I just use SPY here because that's what I saw other people do. And so we're gonna take these couple lines and put those in our initialization function. So I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna go to our uh, strategy. So I'm gonna go here to my initialize. And right here uh, at, in our initialize, I'm gonna do self.spy equals self.add equity uh, spy. And I'm gonna get the symbol object right there. And then every day I'm gonna schedule a function to run every day. And that function is gonna be called after market open. And inside of this after market open function, so I'm going to define a function called uh, after market open, just like that. I'm going to just run some code. And so you'll see if I run this in my debugger now, you'll see that this function is going to fire right at the market open and this self.time will be a 9.30 or 9.31, right? And the reason it's gonna be 9.31 is because if you scroll up here, you'll see schedule on every day. I specified one minute after the market opens. I could specify 15 minutes after the market opens if I want to. And so if I go to my debugger here, so I'm gonna to go to my debugger, you can see uh, I'm going to continue. I'm gonna remove this breakpoint and I'm gonna continue on to my after market open. And you'll see I forgot to include the uh, self right there. So I'm going to uh, stop this real quick and I'm going to run it one more time. And indeed, you can see my breakpoint stop right here and after market open on the 20th, it's at 931. I can run whatever code I want. Continue on 931 on July 21st. July 22nd and so forth. And so what I'm gonna do is since, for instance, it's July 22nd, I'm gonna request the past couple of days of history and see uh, what the price looked like uh, on July 20th and also July 21st, because July 21st would be the follow through day and then the previous day before that would be the day at reported earnings. So how do we go about fetching historical price data for each of the symbols in our universe? Well, we're gonna use what's called history request, and we're going to loop through all of the securities in the current universe. And so after the market opens, what we're gonna do is loop through all the active securities. We're going to request historical data for each one of those securities, and then compare uh, the previous open high low, clo low close to the one that occurred after earnings. So let's go ahead and do that. And so I'm gonna take this line for security and act self active security dot values. And I'm gonna put that inside of my algorithm here. So in aftermarket open, I'm gonna say for security in self dot active securities, active securities dot values, just like that. And I'll put a pass here. Once again, I like to uh, run these line by line to show you what's going on. And so let me restart my debugger here. And let's see what's inside of this uh, security object. Okay, so I will run this. My execution is pause after the market opens and you can see uh, my current security. So if I add a watch here, so you see uh, I have self and I have my current security. And if I expand my security, you'll see it's currently on uh, a security that has a bid and ask price and an open high, low and close in the present. And if I scroll down here, let's see what symbol this is. This is the symbol, uh, symbol and then symbol dot value is SPY. So why is SPY in there? Because I added that as an equity here. So now it's part of my current universe. If I continue to the next one, you see I hit Novartis. And if I hit to the next one, you see I hit uh, Lockheed Martin. And so I don't want to trade SPY. So what I'm doing uh, in the docs here is I'm checking uh, the security, the current 
security symbol, and I'm saying if it's spy, then just continue. And so there might be another way to do that. I'm just skipping over it for now since I don't want to trade it. And then it'll only sh do a Lockheed Martin and a Novartis, which I selected there, okay? Uh, so that's how you loop through the current securities in your universe. Now what we need to do is call uh, the history function here to request history data. And I've linked to this document here about history requests so you can see uh, how this works. So there's a couple ways to get historical data. You can either use algorithm warmup. So what you can do is let your algorithm run a certain number of days and just populate the price data that way. I think that's a little bit more efficient. You just wait until you have enough data to uh, detect what you want. You can also make a specific explicit request. And that's what I'm gonna do here. What this allows you to do is call a history function and request some data. So you call self.history here. You give it a symbol, a resolution, and a number of bars. And so you can see they're calling history here and they're requesting for uh, the symbol for Bitcoin. They want minute data and they're requesting five minutes. And so you see here, this returns a pandas data frame, which you should be familiar with because I use them on this channel all the time. So uh, July 9th, so 401, 402, 403, 404, 405. So each minute you see the open, high, low, close and volume just like that. And that's what we're gonna do here, except we're gonna look at it on the daily time frame. And so what I did here, uh, if you scroll down, you'll see I got history data uh, for the on the daily time frame for each symbol. So we loop through the symbols, we pass the symbol in. We just want two days of data here. Um, actually, I'll, I'll request a little bit more than two days of data uh, just to show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna let's let's request uh, seven days of data for now. And then I'm also going to try to detect a very specific setup. So uh, let's look at that DocuSign setup that everyone was talking about. So uh, let me indent that. And so earlier uh, I mentioned in the docs, this uh, DocuSign example that people were highlighting. So it had that power earnings gap. So I just wanna show a situation where there was a power earnings gap and then the price ran afterwards. So let's try to look at this. So this was from uh, June of 2021 and I have the chart pulled up right here. So that's around June 3rd or June 4th, I think. And so what I can do here, let me go up to the top here and I'm gonna start at 2021 on June a third, and I'm not sure, it's gonna occur in a couple of days probably, so uh, depending on when the earnings file date is. And so I'll request some data. Yeah, let me run this for June 3rd and loop through the security values and see what this history data looks like. So I'll set a breakpoint right here and let's study this history data. All right, so my execution is paused. You can see I hit my uh, first uh, history request here. So you see history data. And let me add a watch for security.symbol.value, or let me just do symbol.value since I'm already uh, storing it. There's AEO. Let me see when I hit DocuSign. There's Zoom, CRM, PAGS. All right. And then let me see, there's Costco earnings. And let me also log the current date I'm looking at to see when we run into a DocuSign. So this is uh, day four, June 4th here. And so I'm going to continue until I hit DocuSign. And another thing I can do, one other trick, is you can right click here, do edit breakpoint, and you can add a uh, conditional breakpoint. So I can say symbol.value equal equal docu, just like that. And what I'll do is continue, and that'll pause, specifically if I wanna inspect DocuSign, I'll pause when that condition is true. And look at that, I hit continue, and it paused when the symbol is DocuSign. So that's a conditional breakpoint right there. And now I can inspect this, and look at it. So I know that DocuSign recently reported earnings, and then I just requested seven days of historical data here. You see I have a, a variable here now called history data. And if I expand this out, you'll see it has a number of columns. So it says uh, open, high, low, close, and volume is, are in there. And then you can see each of those columns here. So there's the high column, there's the close column. If I expand the close column, you should be able to scroll down and see the values. So you see size seven, it's because I requested seven days. And then the values are right here. So look at this, uh, all seven of those closed values. And so you can see the most recent one, the last row here, you see it says 233 is the close. Um, that's probably the close here. So yeah, you see that close, look up here and I hover over that. You see that close up top there next to the C, it says 233.24. And then the close before that, you see I have a 194. A 75, and if I look here, yeah, there you go, 194.75. And then there's a close before that that's 
uh, 253 cents and you see my 253 cents. So you see there, there's the big gap that occurs right there. And so we can operate on these last two, uh, these last two rows in the close column. And so you see what I'm doing here is I'm just storing these in a, in a variable. So I'm accessing the pandas data frame, I'm accessing the close column, and I can use this negative indexing to access the last close in that column. So negative one is gonna be the last row. So that's the last row in this pandas data frame. That'll get me my 233.24. I'm gonna assign that to close day after earnings. And then I'm gonna get the negative second. So the one before the last row, and that's that one. And I'm gonna assign that to close day before earnings right there. So that's a negative second. And then I'll set another breakpoint and move down. So let's go ahead and uh, let's just step through it. So I'm gonna do step, 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 step. Right, and then you see, if I look in my variables, you'll see I have the close day before earnings and then close the day after earnings. And you can kind of guess where this is going here. So if we continue uh, with this calculation, all we need to do is in my documentation here, all I'd need to do is get the price gap. So I just get the close the day before earnings and the open the day after earnings, get the price gap difference, and then I can calculate a percentage from that. So I get the price gap, so how far they are apart. Over the previous close, I get a percentage that it gapped up, and then I can also get a closing strength. So uh, let's go ahead and do that first part here. So. Uh, after I calculate, after I access that pandas data frame, and I put a try catch here because sometimes history data is unavailable, so I don't want to run any uh, calculations or if there's no history data or it'll throw an error. So I catch that exception. If I don't have the history data, I just continue and move to the next one. But if I do have uh, history data, I'll calculate that price gap and the percent gap. And then remember, part of a power earnings gap is we need a strong close. So we want the uh, close at the end of the following day. So we care about the close of the previous day, the open of the next day, and we also want the close the next day to be near the high, right? So we want it to be this large green candle. We don't want it to fade out at, at all. So we want to measure uh, how high it is as a percentage of the close. And that's why I have this close strength right here, and we can adjust that as needed. So what I'm saying is the close strength is equal to the close the day after earnings minus the open day after earnings. And so we're, we're making a ratio here uh, versus the high the day after earnings versus the open the day after earnings, right? And so basically what I'm doing is calculating what percentage the green part fills up of the high of the day, right? And, and I hope that makes sense. And so uh, the, the difference between here and here on, on the green filled area versus the difference of when it is at the high. So you can see this is like 90% or so of the high, right? There's this little wick right up there. And so let's look at what these values are and it'll make more sense. So uh, I'll go right here and let me get my close strength. And let me go ahead and fill in the rest of this. And so you see, I have my percent gap calculated here. And so let's let's go ahead and fill in this part and step through it line by line and talk about it. So I'm for here, I'm just hard coding a value of the percent gap, and I'm saying I want it to be greater than five percent. And we need to experiment with these values to see like what one, one thing that's a little bit vague about these descriptions is with a power earnings gap is well, how high of a percent does the gap need to be? How strong does it need to close? Strong is not really a specific you know, quantifiable word. And so we just kind of have to fill in values here. And that's not, it's just not very exact without any type of back test, right? And so when we're trying to code this, we're, we're just trying to figure out what they mean and, you know, figuring out if there's any truth to it. And so the only way uh, we can determine this, since they don't give us a computer program, these are just traders who have, are spreading folklore, basically, um, we need to, you know, figure out for ourselves, is there any truth here? Or is this just a bunch of junk, right? And so I'm going to uh, hit my debug there and I really need to figure out a better workflow for that. Maybe I shouldn't be stopping this and disconnecting and, and restarting it there. Maybe there's an easier way to stop that. So I'll experiment with this and get better uh, with the platform so I don't have to stop the machine over and over again. Okay, so you see, I went ahead and let this run. Uh, so that's for Zoom. Um, I wanna go ahead and let this run for DocuSign though. So uh, let me go ahead and let this continue on and let it stop at DocuSign. I still have my conditional breakpoint right there. I'm gonna step over, let it fill in all of my price data, calculate my price gap. So you see uh, the close of the day after earnings is 233, close day before earnings, 194. I calculate my price gap. So you see price gap now has uh, 15, uh, 15, uh, 68. 
Um, and that's because, oh yeah, we're calculating the open, right? So it closed at 194, it gapped up and opened at 210. So the difference between those two is 1568 right there. And then um, we continue on, we get a percent gap. So we calculate a percentage there and it turns out that's a percent gap of 8%, right? And then I step over, there's my closing strength. And so I'm saying that the closing strength is 93% of the high. So it closed uh, at 93% of the high. So that is the strength you see of how much it takes versus uh, the how high it closed versus the high of the day. So that I consider that a very strong follow through as described in the article. And now I compare the percent gap. And since we have an 8% gap, we can step over and you see I'm logging that, right? And so in my log here, I'm logging symbol.value gapped up by, and I'm logging that information. That way we can look at our logs and see, you know, what's coming out here, does it make sense? Uh, we can study the results and figure out whether we have a trading strategy here and whether this is legitimate or not. And okay, okay. And then, and then here, now that we know that there's a percent gap of greater than five percent, I'm going to also check if it's a strong close. So I want to make sure it didn't fade first. So I want to make sure the close the day after earnings is higher than the close the day before earnings. So we want to know it at least closed up after the gap. And also, I'm checking the closing strength. That's greater than 0.5. Maybe we, later we'll try 0.7 or 0.8 to make sure it's a really strong close. And I'm logging whether it was a strong close or not. Okay. So now I can go ahead and stop all this and I'm going to turn off my debugging and I'm just gonna let this run through and I'm gonna let it run for a certain range of time. So I'm gonna do a set start date or set end date of 2021 and then August uh, 3rd. So let, let me just let it run through that period and see what it spits out. And so let's let this run and this should log a bunch of power earnings gap setups. And there you go, I have it running now, and you can see it's logging a bunch of power earnings gap setups. You can see my MongoDB uh, that we talked about. So if you scroll to the top on MongoDB, you can see the power earnings gap that occurred here in early June of 2021. It ran after that. And then you can see five docus, looks like Stitch Fix. Oh, and I'm also logging when it faded after earnings. So Stitch Fix is an example. So if we're able to look at Stitch Fix from uh, 2021. Let's see what that looked like. So look at this. There's the earnings. There's the gap. So giant gap, gapped way up. But look at that. That's not a power earnings gap because it faded. Red candle, red candle. And so we didn't want to trade that one because it faded after the earnings gap. And then so we could define our order and say, oh, well, that's not a power earnings gap. We're not going to trade it at all. And you can see it indeed crashed pretty big after that, right? And then we can look through some more. Uh, looks like RH, so uh, that was at home restoration hardware, which I don't think is doing very well anymore. So if we look at June 2021, you see it. this one had a power earnings gap, but look at that. It faded all the way uh, back down. So one thing I'm trying to determine and right here is whether uh, in the article I mentioned a few that I'm I considered failures, but I'm not quite sure if Trader Stewie considers these failures. So if you look at Cloudflare at the beginning of this video, I said, oh, that's a failure because it had a power earnings gap and then eventually faded all the way down. And then the same with uh, Etsy and the same with Trade Desk, but he might actually call these like falling wedges. So he might say, there was a power earnings gap and then it kind of drifted lower but didn't uh didn't close below this initial gap so he might actually say you want to take you might want to let this digest and then trade it uh, when it comes closer to the point of the initial gap right and so he'll post setups that look like in phase here uh you don't he doesn't enter these immediately he waits till they digest a while same with array technologies and same with this catalyst of uh, pharmaceuticals so this had a power earnings gap but he didn't enter immediately he waited till it faded a little bit so if we look at this cprx right it gapped up but then it just kind of pauses there for a while and then now only in the last a couple days, it looks like it's up 12% in the past week. So uh, I'm not quite sure whether to call uh, these failures or not. What do, you, what do you think, right? I'm kind of asking the audience here because I'm not gonna enter an exit quite yet. We'll try an entrance immediately and you'll see that maybe the results aren't very good, but let me know what your thoughts on how you would trade this. One thought I had was uh, entering immediately and then catching some of the momentum. One other thought I had is waiting a little bit, waiting for it to consolidate and then entering a later, as long as it doesn't close below this initial uh, price that was before earnings. And then one thought was, you know, to enter immediately and then uh, 
exit whenever it closes below a moving average. So you see all these popped up and then uh, there's the 21 day EMA for instance that I have right there. And so maybe you just let it stop out whenever uh, it reverses trend for instance. So yeah, let me know what you think about that. So now we're at the point in the tutorial where you have the code and I've given you a complete write up on how to detect this setup and you should be able to run from there and execute some orders and hit the play button and let Quant Connect tell you what the results are and you can make decisions for yourself. So uh, I've already done a tutorial on the uh, algorithmic trading engine, the lean tutorial that I did the last video where we make market orders and I show you how to run the back test. And so you should be able to combine these two together and and uh, run this and compare different results and different entries and exits. And it's not a lot of work to uh, make those decisions yourself and see the results. So just as a quick example on how you might want to uh, enter an exit, let's say we want to enter the trade right after we detect the uh, power earnings gap, uh, we could use Quant Connect and we could look up how to place a market order. So there's how you place a market order just like that. So what I can do is go into my code here and when we detect this uh, this uh, symbol uh, close strong, let's go ahead and place an order there for the stock symbol. So I'm going to put a symbol right there and let's just order 100 shares and let me see if that works. So I'm just gonna order 100 shares after I detect the power earnings gap. And when I run that, you see it starts uh, running this back test and you see uh, when it goes up and down and you can see a record of all of our orders and see if this is effective. And so uh, I think we started this with $100,000 and there's some results right there showing a 4% return with what we just did there. I didn't put a lot of thought into this. And then if I scroll down here, you can see uh, how we're using more and more of our money. And so you wanna experiment with different account balances, different position sizes and so forth. If you scroll down here, Quant Connect will show you all of the different orders that were placed. So I'm gonna scroll down. I'm gonna click orders right here. And so you can see where it bought DocuSign, MongoDB, uh, RH, Restoration Hardware, Snapchat, and so forth. And this is from 2021. And so if I can click that, download all the different orders that it placed, and then there's my CSV file. And then I can pull this up for you and show you what it looks like. There you go. Those are the orders that we placed, market orders we placed between June and July of 2021. DocuSign, MongoDB, Restoration Hardware, Snapchat, and Tilray right there, right? And when do you exit them? That's kind of up to you to decide. Let's say we uh, place a uh, limit order. So let's say after that market order, I want to take profit at a certain point. So I can place a limit order after that, right? And so I can say limit order, and I've already discussed this in the uh, previous tutorial. So I can place a limit order for that symbol. And instead of positive 100 shares, I can sell 100 shares to buy and do negative 100. And then I can say, let's say I wanted to take two or 3% profit. I could uh, sell it at a certain price. So I need to specify the price that I wanna sell it at. And so let's say we uh, sell it the uh, close day after earnings. So let's do the close day after earnings or we could get the current price and then we can multiply that times 1.02, right? And I wanna lock in 2% gains for instance, right? So I could run that and see what happens. So let's see if I'm able to lock in 2% gains and then I can continue from there and say, uh, I, I can set a stop order right after that if I want to as well. And so all of those order types are documented here in the Quant Connect uh, documentation and you can try those out as well. So look at that. I. Uh, I tried to lock in 2% gains. All right, there you go. I ran this, you saw the chart there. And so it looks like my returns were a little bit worse. And so if I scroll down here, let's look at my orders tab again, you see those uh, sell limit orders were placed and let's download this and look at these orders, right? So I'm gonna open this and then you can see where I executed uh, this buy order for MongoDB and also a sell order a couple percent higher. And then you can see whether or not these sell orders were filled or not. So you can see uh, the MongoDB sell there and that was a profit. You can see the DocuSign uh, limit order place, that was a profit. But then you can see, yeah, what do you see? Restoration hardware, that was also filled, but Snapchat was not filled and Tilray was not filled. So those were uh, submitted, but not filled. And so if I go over and look at Tilray, 
uh, for July of 2021. Let me just use Google real quick. So five year, you can see Tilray in July of 2021. Looks like this thing has just been downtrading, downtrending uh, ever since. So uh, buying that on the power earnings gap did not work out very well for me. And so you can experiment with different stop losses as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.